Schumann was 17 years old when Beethoven died in 1827. In my observations, Schumann and Beethoven were the two composers with most similar personalities and faith. Very passionate, fiery, obsessed with many ideals. Often they had a particular haunting motif in their music, like the main theme of the Schumann's in G minor sonata. When inspired, Schumann and Beethoven both would have an outburst of creativity. Their creative energy were unstoppable. Both were restless most of the time of their lives. Both might have suffered bipolarity, extreme excitement intertwining with depression. Musically speaking, Schumann showed a strong affinity to Beethoven's approach in writing music, which I would like to discuss at some other time. We look at the fate of these two composers. Both experienced rejections from the families of their loved ones. It was a long battle before Schumann married Clara Wick, while Beethoven never had a chance to marry several women he fell in love with. Both experienced physical challenges as well. Schumann in his young age had to give up his dream to be a concert pianist as he injured his finger. Beethoven progressively lost his hearing and later on in his life he completely lost his hearing. What a tragic turn. But these physical challenges became important factors that created these two legends. However, these two legends had different final chapters. Beethoven's musical power gained so much strength toward the end of his life. It was a glorious, triumphant ending. Schumann, on the contrary, suffered worsening mental illness toward the end of his life. His first medical diagnosis was in 1833 at the age of 23 describing him suffering from melancholic depression. In 1854, he tried to commit suicide by drowning himself into the Rhine River. He was rescued against his will from that suicide attempt. Soon after that incident, Schumann was admitted to a mental asylum in Andenich and died two years later in 1856 from pneumonia. Even though this issue with his mental health and imbalance had caused Schumann a great misery, it also had become the driving energy behind his outpouring creativity for about two decades long. All those beautiful and noble pieces of music came from an extremely sensitive soul and an extremely complex and highly imaginative mind. This extreme sensitivity and complexity of the soul and mind had made the persons to become very vulnerable to mental disturbance. Eventually and tragically, this extreme sensitivity and complexity had costed the life of this composer. Let us not take it for granted the beautiful and noble music that came out of Schumann's misery. Let us analyze his music to appreciate more what a great legacy Robert Schumann had left us with. This G minor sonata somewhat reveal not only the genius but the suffering that Schumann had to endure. Schumann publications from Opus 1 to Opus 23 were only for piano. Never again such intensity for writing piano music returned in his life. This was the period before Schumann married Clara Wick, but the two were already in love. Clara was a well-established concert pianist, and Schumann took lessons from her father. Definitely, Clara was one of his inspirations for writing these many masterpieces for the piano. But perhaps Schumann was also still absorbed with his earlier ambitions of becoming a concert pianist but had to give up due to his finger injury. This amount of masterpieces are definitely a product of a genius, both the quantity and the quality. They are all so varied, so full of imaginations, full of beautiful melodies, full of clever harmonic progressions, so full of imaginations. Speaking of imaginations, one of Schumann's biggest contributions to piano music is the characteristic pieces that he left many for us. Characteristic piece or character piece means a short piece of music having a specific intentions of mood or conveying an extra musical reference. For example, when I was a kid, I loved so much Heavy Farmer or Night Rupert from his album For the Young, was 68. Perhaps Schumann's most famous characteristic piece, Tromerai or Daydream, number 7 from Opus 15, Kinder Zenon, or Scenes from Childhood. Schumann's earliest talent was a writer. His father was an established publisher and a writer himself who owned a bookstore. Schumann's childhood must be surrounded by abundance of literature, in which he was so much absorbed into. The house shown here in the picture is where Schumann was born and spent his childhood and teenage years. Schumann was the youngest of five. 
At school, the young Schumann excelled in storytelling, both in writing and in making a speech. At the age of 16, he already wrote two novels. Therefore, it is very natural for him to find music at best in expressing his stories, and this came out in the form of characteristic pieces that became one of the staples of the Romanticism. Later, Schumann also felt at home in writing a huge collection of art songs. Apart from these characteristic pieces, we have the three piano sonatas, the traditional genre. Schumann always felt that after Beethoven, no one could write the sonata. Nevertheless, he made several attempts with much success. The sonata opus 22 was published later than the opus 14, but it was written earlier. Therefore, it retains as the second sonata. The reason for the late publications was the substitutions of the last movement upon the request of Clara. These three sonatas are like a different world than the characteristic pieces that Schumann wrote. These sonatas are more like a personal expressions, internal stories rather than external stories. Therefore, there are so many of Schumann's untold stories can be found in his sonatas. All sonatas are in the minor keys. All are in four movements in the grand symphonic fashion. Along with Schumann's peculiar elegance, harmonically and melodically, the troubled soul is revealed in all of these three sonatas. But the special feature from the second sonata is that it ends in minor tonality, unlike its siblings that transform to the parallel major keys. Glorious, triumphant ending of the F-sharp major in the first sonata and F major in the third sonata. The last movement of the second sonata, both the original one and the new one, and in G minor. Second sonata is the most concise, but it gives us a closer look at the troubled soul of this composer. This straightforward theme has a very strong rhythmic drive, the long, short, short, long rhythmic motif. This theme will obsessively haunt the entire first movement. There are some connections to the other movements, but I will not go into that in this lecture. Perhaps the most famous feature of this second sonata is its tempo marking. It starts with indication as fast as possible. To begin with, I cannot think of any other masterpieces with such tempo marking. If any, definitely this is a rarity. Toward the end of the first movement, Schumann wrote faster, and at the coda, even faster. Logically, it does not make sense. What is faster than already the fastest? But let's get to the real message that Schumann is delivering here. He meant continuously intensifying restlessness for the performer. In the slower tempo andantino, the restlessness appears in the unsettled harmony that opens all of the phrases. The C major and G minor relationship is unusual for a sonata, and this C major tonality appears only briefly in the beginning and at the ending of the phrases. The harmonic progression is rather elusive here, one transformation after another. Quite the opposites from the first movement, here Schumann wrote abundance of retardando. It does not mean for this movement to get slower and slower. The message is like, let have the beauty last forever. A series of repeated notes in a very obsessive compulsive nature and sarcastic mood opens the third movement, Scherzo. Scattered Swarzandi and accents, mostly in syncopations, heighten the restlessness. Very fast tempo dominates this sonata. The troubled soul is always on a run, fleeing from something terrifying. The original finale also depicts the troubled soul on a run. At times, he is on a run pursuing something compulsively, and at other times desperately escaping from something. Both original finale and the substitute finale have presto markings. Rondo is the perfect form to portray the haunted nature or the obsessed nature of the troubled soul. The stormy Rondo theme will keep returning. Strong accents are scattered throughout this last movement too. Many are in syncopations that effectively amplify the restlessness. And at the end, Schumann added a cadenza, unleashing desperate madness in Prestissimo, and he even notated always faster and faster. A 
Let us observe the design of the accompaniment in the first movement. Schumann was not the first or the only one to write in such figurations, but his choice of this figuration is very effective to express his restlessness. Schumann placed the bass line at the last semiquaver. Other composers usually wrote this kind of figurations in a slow-moving music, but here Schumann wrote it in a very high speed. This displacement effectively creates the dizzying tremor. The theme itself appears in a short period of time, successively three times, or five times if we count the counter-melody imitations. It does create the sense of urgency. And what comes next can also be another example of the troubled soul revealed. Is it like the composer's desperate scream? Repeated notes are still pounding here, but not running from a terrifying torment, but toward a triumphal arrival, compulsively. Not this year, after a very agitated run, Schumann transforms the frantic opening motif to a glorious climax. And soon, for a short eight bars, Schumann makes another transformation of the initial motif for the secondary theme of the expositions. Schumann was on the same track as that of Beethoven, who was very much absorbed in developing the initial motif. However, there is a fundamental difference in how the two work. Beethoven did more calculation in seeking a perfect balance and proportion in his compositions. Schumann was more of the spontaneous type. Schumann's mental state operates like a flash flood. So many master works he wrote in a relatively short period of time. Like those piano works I mentioned earlier during his first decade as a composer, that includes this sonata. And as we explore his second sonata, we see how much energy Schumann poured out into his music. When inspired, Schumann had that unlimited obsessive compulsive energy. A very highly imaginative person, so imaginative that Schumann always feared someone had the intention of poisoning him. Schumann had poured out his troubled soul and mind into an art form in this Piano Sonata Op. 22, which also contributed to the romanticisms, the dramatic outpouring of human emotions and conditions. The extraordinary sensitivity, powerful imagination, and complexity of mind had caused Schumann to suffer greatly in his life. But the same matters had given birth to numerous extraordinary music we delight in. Hats off to you, Schumann, a genius artist, and we do thank you. <laughs>